Good, and we have a few people joining. I might put something on the chat. Right. Right. Some people joining from Melbourne. Hi, Alex. Joining from Melbourne. Julius from Melbourne, south of Australia. Great. Mighty Melbourne. So count. Great. Awesome. We um we might get started. Uh, so welcome to uh, another episode of Data Futurology, where we we speak with. Um, researchers, leaders in the, and leaders in the data analytics space from all around the world. Today, we are speaking with Matthew Dixon. Uh, and mate, it is an absolute pleasure to have you in the show. Matthew is an a, a assistant professor in applied math and has just written a book, which is <laughs> extremely interesting. Um, I used to work in, in finance uh, for the five years um, before, before this year. And, um, and Matthew has written the book that, you know, I wish existed when I was working in finance. And so I'm, I'm very, very sure that people are going to um, take to it and, um, and hopefully devour this about 550 pages. It's called Machine Learning in Finance. Uh, and it has a, a, tr a whirlwind of, um, of, of content, well, a huge amount of content. So... Um, Matthew, obviously, I'll ask you to, to tell us more, but you're, you're covering, you know, Bayesian, uh, the, the Bayesian side, frequentist perspective. Um, you've got neural networks, uh, deep learning, uh, supervised learning for time series data, um, and applications of reinforcement learning for trading. Uh, that is a phenomenal, phenomenal um, amount of content to cover, phenomenal book. Um, I, I love the fact that you're focusing on the, on the theory and the applications both in one. Um, they come as a nice, neat little package. Um, first, I'll ask you, what, what, um, what drove you to write the book and how was the process? <laughs> Yeah, well, well, thanks, um, you know, for the for the for the glowing endorsements. I'll try to live up to that um, today. Um, but I think, you know, when I sort of actually, I've been uh, a little, you know, if I step back a little bit, uh, you know, I've been working in quant finance, uh, you know, as early as the you know, beginning of the twenty first century. So I'm I'm pretty ancient. I mean, I've been involved in the industry for a long time, really twenty years. You look great. Um, you look great. Well, well, right. well thanks. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well. Um, and I'd worked in Silicon Valley for a little bit, and I saw how machine learning was unfolding there. And I just, I got the sense there's a huge gap between Wall Street and the way that they were thinking, you know, traditional actuarial mathematics and statistics. And then on the other hand, machine learning. And it's just this giant chasm. And every time I, I sort of spoke about machine learning for trading, I came up with the implemented code um, for Intel. They wanted to see a, a, a sort of a use of their Intel processors. Um, you know, it just was met with, with kind of, you know, apathy. No one believed it. And, uh, and those that did, you know, were, well, you know, arrive on the Campbell will, of course, and then there were the, all the skeptics. And I just felt that there was just a gap. You know, there was a lot of uh, more experienced quants, finance professors, industry professionals who were saying, well, look, you know, we've seen this before, right? We've seen the bubbles. You know, we've seen neural networks in the 90s. What's new here? You know, what's different from say genetic algorithms? Why isn't this just another bubble or a hoax? And so that really pushed me over the years yes. to try and substantiate both, you know, A, that it works, you know, and re is reproducible to the you know, standard of data science. And B, you know, you can explain why this works. Mm. Um, and I think, you, you know, to get sort of the skeptics on board, you, you, have, to, you, you have to sort of field to, to those, you've got regulators in finance, you've got, you know, all the classical finance um, sort of, you know, theorists, you know, who love their pharma French efficient market hypotheses. It's not just about data science. And so it's this sort of uh, crucible of all these different disciplines and you've got to somehow make everyone eat from the same plate. Exactly, and and I hadn't, I hadn't thought about the the fact that for people that have been around a long time in the industry that they 
that they would have felt like they were burnt by some of their bubbles before and that they would be so such skeptics about you know is it am i going to get burnt again essentially or why why will it work this time um and i thought that that the the approach was um the approach that you took with the book was was really good to to help uh, show show those people the the value that that other sectors are, are getting and how the, how to contextualize those learnings into into finance. Um, so what was what was the trigger to to start the book to start writing the book? Because it's a long process, man. Um, how 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 was the tr- or what was the trigger and how was the process for you? Yeah, I think the trigger was just really doing some market research. Um, I was asked to teach a course in this area. Um, you know, I, I sort of landed on three different books that I liked and, you know, nothing that really hit the, the core of what I wanted to teach. So um, I, you know, started sort of preparing my own notes, um, putting together, uh, you know, sort of papers and, and sort of technical reports. And it was really um, when I met uh, Igor Halperin, who at the time was... Uh, uh, a New York uh, financial engineering professor, um, you know, veteran in the finance industry, executive director uh, director at J.P. Morgan, uh, and you know, a, a sort of a big, a big giant sort of gorilla in the room um, when it comes to to theory and, and big ideas. And I met him, and and within about five minutes of speaking to him, I realized that he just had this way of thinking about things, which sort of filled the gaps. And between us uh, and 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 another colleague, um, Paul Bellicon. We really felt that we had the, um, you know, the kind of firepower to to see this through to completion because that's the biggest risk, right? You start something, yeah. and then you know along the way, you know, life happens, COVID, whatever it is, and, mm-hmm. and before you know it, it's just shelved and you're fighting and you know other fires. So you had, you know, we had to be very sure that this thing was going to go through, uh, and it wasn't just you know going to sort of fall on the wayside because um, it, you know, it's an enormous amount of time, and it took two years to really put all the content together and, uh, you know, no weekends for, you know, for most of 2019. Yeah. The, the effort, the effort is, is tremendous. Um, yeah. And as I said, like the, the book is 550 pages, um, of, of, of solid, of solid gold material. Um, so it's, um, no, I'm sure it's a, it's a huge, huge effort. And how, how did you balance that with, um, with your with your teaching duties and 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 obviously your consulting work um, that that you've been doing for for a long time now, can you tell us a little bit about uh, well a little bit about both sides of, of of your world, both of those sides of your world, the teaching duties, the the consulting work, and then and then how um, how those influence the the book? Yeah, I think it's a great question because. It, it, you know, if you, and I think this is general advice, you know, if you, if you sort of compartmentalize, you know, various components of your life or your professional duties, uh, then it gets incredibly difficult to do something like this. So I think, you know, what I did was I looked at the current sort of consulting work I'd done, you know, areas where we were currently working, you know, where you're not allowed to, obviously, um, because of disclosure agreements, say anything about what you're doing, but how could you, how could you lift some of that, motivate some of the material um, and, and I think it's just really, you know, a lot of planning into what is the sort of the core material that, you know, I can, I can sort of double up, use both in the consulting, you know, as, as, a, as a sort of a runway to the, to the full scale project, um, you know, to get others interested in this area. Uh, so I think it's just a lot of balancing, you know, I mean, I think we planned out sort of 18 months milestones every month. Um, you know, occasionally we actually hit those on time. Uh, and, and I think, you know, you have to be somewhat fluid. It's not going to unfold the way you want to uh, when you've got, oh, clearly you've got other constraints, you know. So, I mean, I spend about, you know, 20, 30 hours a week uh, sort of doing research. Um, and I probably spend about 10, 20 hours teaching. And then, you know, because of consulting sort of just fits around that, um, you know, so it's, it's, uh, it's, it can be, you know, it can be very challenging at the time, but I think ultimately those all complement each other. Mm, definitely, definitely. And um, so I, I, I assume that, that the, um, the book would have started by, by bubbling away in the back of your head as you're going through the, through the consulting gigs and, and through, through the teaching. Um, and, and now do you get, um, do you get to tell your, your clients like, um, 
read this book <laughs> as well as your your students how how do you see the 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 material being leveraged um, now that it's that it's in um, in a solid book format yeah that that's another great question you know I what you know I guess there's more to the story I mean I I saw how um, Attila Mucci kind of built his career around a great book I mean he he basically wrote a book about 10 years ago on uh, sort of non-parametric finance. Uh, he was at Bloomberg at the time. Now he runs a very well attended uh, workshop. You know, he has you know, regularly sort of 200 people, uh, you know, uh, paying sort of full, full fees to attend his weekly workshop. And he built that all off the book. Um, it's very well written. And, and there are others, um, Eves Hilpish, he wrote Python and Finance. You know, he, he's also recently written uh, uh, machine learning sort of hands-on uh, sort of Python book. Great, uh, you know, I use that when I teach Python and those books really set you up for, for, for a lot of other downstream activities. So that was very much in the forefront of the mind. And of course, you know, you've got an instant reference point when you approach a client, um, you know, they sort of, uh, you can have them look at the material and then say, look, you know, uh, through these frameworks, how can we explore your problem? So it's a great way to sort of scaffold into other applications that you haven't considered. Um, and you've immediately got, you know, essentially, um, you know, a sort of a, a base or a platform to then look at those other problems. Um, and, you know, even before any sort of contracts are signed, you've already exchanged code, you know, you've already got a sense of, uh, you know, of what can be expected in, in, in terms of tangible deliverables. So I think it's a, it's a great way to, uh, to, to, to also open up consulting on the other on the other hand there is concern that you know you you will essentially you know too much uh you know you won't sort of uh be uh essentially you know for those that are particularly concerned about privacy maybe concerned that you know uh that you know some work you do ends up in the book or a future version of it um and so you know there's there's a careful um sort of line to walk between clearly respecting the confidentiality of the business you know logic proprietary information and yet on the other hand, trying to sort of, um, you know, uh, sort of bolster industry knowledge. And I love that approach that, um, you know, there, there's a lot of unsolved problems out there that, you know, that, that um, can be, can be uh, pushed forward through cutting edge techniques and that that new knowledge shouldn't stay uh, behind closed doors. So I love, I love that approach of how, how can we, you know, almost like, sanitize the, the story and um and bring out the learnings without giving up any of the confidentiality or privacy that is required uh, and so important uh, you know especially in, in industries like finance um and so by extracting that we can give back or you you're giving back to the community that's um that's fantastic man and before we jump into the contents of the books i want of the book i wanted to ask you how was it that you ended up in finance i saw from your background you did civil engineering and, um, and, you know, in my career, I've worked in my career in analytics and data analytics. I've worked with quite a few people that did civil engineering as a, as a background, and they make really good data analysts and data scientists. Um, I never, I, I never, I've never known why that is the case, but it's, it's a, a pattern that I've seen. Uh, so I wanted to ask you both of those questions. A, how, how was it that you ended up in finance? And do you know why people with a civil engineering background make, make good data analysts and data scientists? Yeah, I mean, it's a great uh, question. And, um, you know, actually Robert Merton, um, a very famous professor, um, was a civil engineer um, before he became a professor of finance, you know, or the, or the Merton consumption problem. Um, so for me, uh, you know, it was really a product of being in London. Um, you know, I went to Imperial College and, you know, when I, in my final year at university, um, you know, I, I kind of went into civil engineering because I liked the math and I wanted to do something mm -hmm. with high societal impact. Mm -hmm. And at the time there was no such thing as data science. I, I didn't yeah. really know what stockbrokers did. I never even heard of a quant. Um, and, you know, as, as I got through the you know, degree, I realized the math is kind of thin. There's a lot of other um, thinking and knowledge you have to have. You have a good understanding of politics, law, you have to push through big infrastructure projects. You have to be very solid in project management. You know, just keeping a crane for an extra day on a construction site, you know, can cost you 50,000. So you have to be a pragmatist. You have to have a lot of range. 
you have to be able to go down into the depths and do structural analysis and calculus. And then you also need to sort of stand back and be able to um, you know, work like a manager. Um, mm -hmm. And I found that part very difficult, but I appreciated it. Uh, and others you know, shine to it more. I, I'm a bit more of a math nerd. Um, and so I kind of, uh, at the end, I just saw investment banks, Lehman Brothers, you know, hiring uh, you know, people with engineering, with science backgrounds. If you, know, if you had a nose for, for sort of uh, you know, money, you could get your head around complex things very quickly, which you have to do as an engineer. Um, and I think that's true for mechanical, electrical, all the disciplines. Um, then I think you can enter into that field very quickly and pick up um, and, and get something working. And, you know, at the end of the day, you've already built that internal discipline to see something through to completion. You know, when it breaks, it doesn't work. Um, and I think, you know, there's an intensity, a determination, a hunger. Um, and at the same time, maybe not likely to go down a massive rabbit hole like a scientist or a mathematician, um, you know, and be, come up with some very sort of abstract view of things, which, you know, obviously is very important, but maybe not when you need to get the job done. So that, that's, you know, my sense is probably the range um, mm -hmm. and the combination of quantitative ability to, to touch on a large number of topics um, is, is probably what makes those, uh, you know, good, good, good at doing this. And I know a number of you work in senior positions uh, who, you know, are sort of very pragmatic about data uh, and, and, you know, and modeling. Yeah, definitely. No, that 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 seems really interesting um, to be able to to have a, a big range, touch a variety of topics, and um, keep keep the end in mind as you're going through solving hard problems and making sure that you're getting to the solution and getting to done is definitely uh, yeah. You you're absolutely right. It's definitely part of the strength um, that that people with a civil engineering background. Um, have uh, in in the sense that I've from what I've seen them as being really good practitioners in the analytic space. Um, that's that's great. That's really good. And and what was it that brought you into into the data side? Yes, I think um, you know as I, I I just sort of had this passion for programming, um, and I just didn't get that fix um, doing engineering. And I you know I. I think I coded up my, you know, all my projects in Java and C++ rather than Fortran, you know, it's sort of back in the days uh, of engineering. Um, and I worked for a while in software for a, a EDS, a software company in the area of uh, defense, building um, of all things, war games. Uh, and then I got the job in, in, in finance, quant finance, working in trading. And I think it was there that uh, I really sort of developed an appetite for data. You know, you had to fit models to the data I realized quickly that that was probably the Achilles heel on the whole approach. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you could have these wonderful models, but if the data, you know, didn't sort of speak to it. Uh, and I think just seeing the trend, having the right skills, piling up on, um, you know, on the sort of skill sets that, that you need to work with big data. Uh, and then things really fell into place when I had to um, do some consulting for a, a private equity firm. And you know, literally anything in math was out of the window. It was just a big sort of wild, wild west of finance, you know, go and discover some companies that, you know, we should invest in. You know, there's no model for that. It's just pure data deluge and hunger and, you know, crawling through data sets, trying to find a needle in a haystack. And I realized at that point, that's probably the most useful skill that you can have is the ability to be able to, you know, to mine um, and, and find the gold nuggets Love it, definitely, man. I had um, thinking ahead of your time there. I, um, I I love it. I love it. Um, cool. So let's uh, let's jump into into the book uh, and some of the content of the book. Uh, I know that uh, a lot of the people who who have joined uh, today, they're obviously they're interested in in finance. They're interested in AI. They're interested in the intersection and how that works. And before we jump in, I should say that. Um, we uh, will be using the Q&A section today. So for anyone that has any, any questions for Matt as we go through and discuss the, the topics, uh, put them in the, in the Q&A section and we will go through, uh, we'll go through those questions. Uh, and I think I saw Phil raise your hand. I don't know if you have anything, uh, uh, and sorry. So questions in the Q&A section, 
then any comments, uh, put them in the chat. Uh, let us know how you're finding the discussion. If you want to hear more of something or or less of something else, let us know, and we'll we'll definitely tailor it, tell, tailor the conversation as as we go through. Um, so yeah, Matt, as I was saying, I this is a book that I wish um, I wish existed uh, when I was working in finance. I was five years in finance. Uh, a lot of that I was I was working in institutional banking, so in the in the B two B side, um, a bit of investment banking in there. Um, and and then I moved uh, to another role that was that was um, more sort of consumer loans um, uh, across the range, loans and insurance, really. Um, so definitely, the um, this content I think is is fantastic. But can you give us an overview of of the book, and then we'll start going into some of the some of the topics if uh, if that works for you? Absolutely. Um, yeah. So thanks for sharing your background, and I'll keep that in mind um, um, as. As, as we, we sort of move forward. So I think, um, you know, just to sort of, for anyone who's new to finance and maybe coming from a data science background, um, let me say a few things there and then, and then vice versa, if you're sort of somewhat familiar with, with finance, but, but maybe don't have so much sort of exposure to machine learning. So I, for finance, um, I think, you know, you really separated into the buy and the sell side. Uh, you know, you've got big investment banks, which are creating products and selling those uh, and those sort of make up um, the bulk of the sort of, you know, the industry uh, in big, you know, financial centers, whether it's Sydney and whether it's London, uh, elsewhere. And then you've got you know, the buy side, which is much more about hedge funds, um, you know, where they take investors' money, they're subject to some regulation, less than banks. And then you've really got the wild, wild west of, uh, you know, of, of finance, which is proprietary trading. Uh, people who if, if trade with their own money uh, at an industrial scale as opposed to just the retail uh, trader. And there's lots of other areas, of course, there's boutique firms that provide, you know, loan financial services, you know, but think about, you know, MasterCard or Visa, uh, you know, there's bankruptcy you know, companies that go after, you know, delinquent loans. I mean, there's a whole sort of industry, you know, parked in the sort of uh, the shadows, if you will, of banking and, and trading uh, and hedge funds and investment managers. And you know, some of it uh, you know, is, is, for so, is socially relevant in the sense that you know, you're, you're working in that area, it has an enormous social impact. If you're managing, pe people's, uh, managing people's pensions, for example, that's an important area. It's a lot of responsibility that goes there. Uh, you could be working in the area of um, potentially helping companies improve uh, the sustainability uh, through their, you know, investing in more sustainable companies, so ESG uh, and those sort of areas. And so you could be taking a very active role in, um, can, you know, in sort of high societal impact uh, areas, or you could be, you know, uh, working, you know, for the devil, um, you know, to put it, to put it blankly. And uh, so you have to sort of, you know, weigh, weigh up, uh, you know, there's a lot of controversy in finance. Uh, and there's a whole new wave of fintech as well. And that's a very exciting area that hopefully we'll maybe talk about a bit later. Uh, so the book itself, I think, tries to tackle these areas. And it's really rooted in what happened in 2008, you know, the, uh, the financial crisis, global financial crisis. Um, you know, a lot of banks went uh, bankrupt. Lehman Brothers was the largest ever uh, corporate bankruptcy in the U.S., uh, if, if indeed not in the world. Uh, and, you know, we saw essentially... Um, the highest U U.S. in employment rate since the 1980s. Um, a lot of people lost their houses. A lot of people lost their, their pensions. Um, and, you know, the, the starting point is, if we'd have machine learning then, you know, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, could we have thwarted the financial crisis? Could we have predicted it? What, you know, are we now sort of safe and dry now that we've got AI and all these sort of different da data sources? And so the book really starts there, um, you know, reminding us of that sort of sobering reality that most of the models that machine learning, you know, was or quant models that were used in finance, many of them built by you know very famous people with you know, incredible accolades and credentials, were, were totally useless. I mean, you know, they were models that were completely incapable of predicting, um, you know, any of the events that happened, um, you know, producing ridiculous results like seven standard deviation, you know, events, um, you know, it, so clearly there was a problem then and 
has that been fixed today? And so the book is really starting with, well, yes. I mean, machine learning does away with a lot of these modeling assumptions. So it's a huge win on the model risk side to not have to you know, go with Gaussian error, not have to buy into all these sort of mathematical simplifications, which ultimately broke when you most needed them. Uh, and so the book works from there. Like how does machine learning work um, in, in this world? How does it select the best model? Uh, and what are the sort of the basic principles of how machine learning does that in a robust way, a way that uh, a human can never do. You know, they would always have a tendency to hardwire particular models. Um, how does a, a machine learning algorithm pick between potentially millions of different model configurations in a way that makes sense and wouldn't go down the same sort of holes or rabbit holes that a lot of the traditional models in finance used. So it really starts from there, but there's a big caveat, you need the data. And if you just use the data feeds that were used back you know, 12 years ago in say the mortgage industry, Fannie Mae, Fannie Mac, sort of a lot of the government data that's produced by the US uh, for, for loans, you would have had a problem. You know, you had to clearly uh, extracted a much wider source of data. And that's now here. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac have put an enormous amount of funds uh, to improve all their data infrastructure, open data APIs. You can download all these different data sets now about the economy down to the granularity of three digit zip codes, uh, combining it with other loan information, Lending Club, Prosper. You've got very rich data sets. You've really got a, a, a barometer now on what's going on in the economy and machine learning is the tool that makes all that work. Um, and then the book really sets out why statistical models couldn't make all that work, why machine learning. Um, and we work through different examples. We try to sort of motivate the pros and cons of a frequentist versus Bayesian setting. You know, do you want to go ultimately with neural networks? Do you want to go with, say, you know, Gaussian processes? Do you want uncertainty as your first class citizen? Or do you want it more as a sort of an afterthought, which is, you know, the Bayesian versus the frequentist, uh, respectively? And you know, I think in finance, uncertainty really matters. Um, mm. The data is not like cats and dogs, where you know you've got a picture of a cat and a picture of a dog, tell us the difference. In finance, there's a lot of noise in the data, and you know, any trader knows there's a huge window of uncertainty in what the price will be in say the next you know hour or something like that. How can you characterize that? Because that's ultimately, as a bank, what you care about is your worst case scenario, you know, the tail regions of that uncertainty distribution. Um, and, and banks really have to deal with that, you know, uh, as first and foremost, and ensuring they're enough capital. And on the trading side, you know, you have to think about the worst case scenario. Um, and so uncertainty really is very important. And we build around that um, as, as the sort of, you know, the starting point for the book with applications in, uh, portfolio modeling. So how do you build sort of portfolio models that are used in asset management? Uh, how do you build high frequency trading models that predict, you know, where to, uh, how to execute and where to place um, you know, orders in the stock market? Um, how do you model, you know, you know, the bond markets or fixed income and extract, you know, the, the signals from a very large set of instruments, a few key signals. Um, so those are sort of the main areas in, you know, the first part of the book. Uh, and then we move into the second part of the book, which is dealing much more with time series. And time series is its sort of own um, you know, animal. And it requires a very different way of thinking than just doing you know, classification on images, for example. Um, how you think about the problem is really quite difficult. Do you do online learning? And so for every single new data point, do you essentially sort of update your model so almost entirely um, and sort of throw away sort of memory of the past if you need to? Or do you sort of carry around a lot of dead weight with a lot of historical data, um, you know, in the hope of just, you know, having some, some more sort of predictive power because you've got more data. And we, we talk about what are called common filters, um, which, you know, kind of um, are used a lot in electrical engineering. They were developed in the 1960s for, you know, ballistic missile tracking they have a really important place in finance. They've done very well in trading. People love common filters and particle filters. And in fact, you know, if you look Google particle filters, you'll find them used in you know, self-driving cars, many applications. And what those do is they, they, they filter the data and sort of really take into account the noise first and foremost. Um, and 
the noise is something that can really throw off the Bayesian and the frequentist frameworks. Mm -hmm. um, whereas in the filtering setup, you, you sort of deal with that first um, and then you really work um, with it in a much more sort of dynamic way. So we try to compare and contrast these three different areas, building out neural network extensions in almost all of them, except uh, Karma filters is a bit more challenging. And then, uh, you know, we show examples, Bitcoin prediction, again, high frequency trading, uh, lots of notebooks, forecasting, comparing it with classical, you know, econometrics models as well. Yeah. That, you know, people would use. So you've got a baseline. So you're not just, you know, pulling out prediction figures out of thin air. You've got a good reference point. And I think you then, you know, start to build a kind of compelling case, um, you know, armed with some statistical tests as well to kind of characterize the data. You know, that guides your choice of machine learning algorithm. Um, and, you know, it isn't just a guess, a guessing game. I think, you know, when I wrote this book, I felt like so much of machine learning to get it to work is just, mm -hmm. you know, turning tunes, tuning knobs and, you know, trying this and trying that. And that's incredibly time consuming. And, mm -hmm. you know, you just don't have time to do that. Um, you know, especially if you, you know, if, if you're, you've got 30 minutes to do this, you do not want to be trying every single possible permutation and combination of parameters. So what I figured out, and, you know, it's something that we've really pushed hard on is use statistics to sort of determine what a lot of those parameters are, you know, how much memory to carry around in the model. There's a statistical test for that. You know, is your data changing all the time or is it fairly, you know, fairly sort of constant statistically? There's another statistical test for that. So when you combine statistics and computer science, which data science is, those two things, right, put together, you have this really powerful and efficient mechanism for, for, for fitting time series. Um, and, you know, you can throw all your usual diagnostics, you know, to show whether your model is better than, you know, white noise. You can show whether your model is statistically similar to another model. So it's just not worth using. Um, you know, there's lots of tests you can do. Um, and then we moved into reinforcement learning with the final part. And there we just kind of really started from a very different perspective. How do you take feedback f f as a result of the decisions taken in your model? How do you take that feedback? So when you make a trade, you change the market. You know, when you do something in finance, you generally change what it is you're observing. You know, it's no different to be taking a, you know, a picture of a fish underwater. You know, it's very likely seeing you and it's behaving differently than it would if it was just sort of naturally there. I say that because I'm, I'm a scuba diver. Um, and, and, and so there's a lot of very interesting parallels with finance. Just by you placing a trade, you're changing the market. You're changing the limit order book, which stores all the bids. How can you incorporate that feedback mechanism as a result of you changing um, in the, into the model. And it's a huge problem for asset management firms. Mm. You know, they have to sell off assets, you know, at the various periods, typically quarterly, and turn over their portfolios. A lot of funds have to do it. You know, dump a lot of stocks that weren't doing well, buy a whole load of others. And it's such a massive amount of stocks that if they dumped all of them, the stock market would move and it would very likely move against you. So you have to break up those orders and the question is how do you optimally break up the order to kind of minimize your footprint on the market again it's a feedback mechanism reinforcement learning is the right way to go about it so we looked at a whole load of problems you know like market impact optimal execution where you place your bids and take the feedback you know from where you place a bid how that moves the the market uh through to portfolio optimization and and kind of just build it out from you know, the classical portfolio optimization theory framework and show what the value add is. Um, and it's a difficult area. You know, it's definitely, uh, I didn't write that part of the book. My, my uh, colleague, co-author Igor did, um, and that's you know, what he specializes in. And he actually even specializes in something more specific than that. He does what's called inverse reinforcement learning, where if you see a bunch of trades how can you infer what the uh, the manager or the asset manager or the trader's utility function is? In other words, wow. what are they trying to optimize? You know, because if you could figure out what your competitors are trying to optimize, you can essentially kind of beat them in the market, right? Because you sort of know ahead of time what's driving them to do things. Um, and it's a technique that's used well and used in marketing as well. Like what what's really driving consumers? You know, when they make certain choices about you know what which, which uh, uh, you know, cell phone contract to pick, or, you know, when they click on ads, you know, what, 
is really driving them behind the scenes. What are they trying to optimize? You know, and so inverse reinforcement learning is essentially looking at your actions and then trying to figure out what it was that was driving you to take those decisions. Um, and again, that has incredibly uh, far-reaching implications. This, you know, this is barely being used right now in finance. So that's really at the very kind of cutting edge. It definitely is. And uh, man, thank you so much for that for that overview. Um, the that the book just sounds fantastic. Uh, so I've got so many so many comments and and follow up questions, and and I might go through and. Um, ask you about different parts of, of the different sections of the book. I would ask, yeah, I might start by asking if you can, uh, for the people that don't know, can you give us a, um, a quick description between, uh, um, uh, sorry, a quick explanation of the difference between Bayesian and frequentist uh, perspectives. And I love how you, you said whether, you know, uncertainty is a first class citizen uh, or an afterthought. Uh, could you expand a little bit on that? Yeah, so I think you know that it, it's best to think about this, um, you know, as as an example. So you know, let's um, you know, let's imagine that you have to you know choose between, you know, you're trying to predict the weather tomorrow. You know, is it going to be sunny? Is it going to rain? Uh, for example, and in the frequentist setup, you're you're actually trying to um, essentially, you know, that you you know that would be a, a what's called a binary classification problem. You know, just an output being a one or a zero, and in the frequentist setup, you're you're trying to essentially maximize um, the what's called the cross entropy, which is really a measure of uh, how how like the model distribution is to to the real distribution of the data. So, for example, if you know the weather's half half of the time fifty, you know, half the time it's raining, half of the time sunny, your model should ultimately match that kind of distribution as well. Um, and so at the end of the day, all you're getting out is, is really you're getting out at sort of a, how confident the model is in, in, in sort of predicting whether it's going to be rainy or it's going to be sunny. So your, your frequentist model might say 50% rain, 50%, you know, uh, sun tomorrow. And, and that's, that's about all you get in terms of the information. Um, and, you know, you can sort of interpret that output as a probability only if the data is IID, meaning, you know, if, if your data is sort of correlated in any way, you, you, can't, you can't do that. And there's a couple of problems there. For a start, there's, there's no prior knowledge about what, you know, from the human even starting, what is the right sort of distribution. Um, so maybe you've already got a sort of a, a better idea and you can kickstart the model without having to start from, you know, tee off from scratch. And in the Bayesian world, it, it sort of turns everything on its head. It, it says, you know, there look, every parameter in your model is, is a source of error. And so if you have a model with a thousand weights, I suppose you fitted a neural network to predict that weather, you might have a thousand weights in that neural network. Or let's suppose you just did linear regression, you've got, you know, maybe three parameters. And what the Bayesian world does is it says, you know, there's no such thing as, um, I'm not really op interested in the optimal fit. In the frequentist world, you get your fit of parameters. You know, you get a number for your intercepts, say you get a number for the coefficients, you get maybe three values. You know, you can write down what the frequentist model is. And those parameters are the best fit parameters. What the Bayesian world does is says, you're contracting, you're throwing away far too much information. Let's keep how, let's keep an uncertainty distribution around each of those parameters. Let's keep all that information baked into the model. Let's not just look at the mean of that distribution, which is essentially what the frequentist world does. So you're keeping around a lot more information, the full distribution of each of the parameters in the model. And at the end of the day, when you put those parameters into the model, you're getting an uncertainty around each parameter and then overall an uncertainty from the output of the model. And that uncertainty, is what's called allostoric uncertainty. And it captures how much uncertainty there really is in the model, how uncertain the model is. In the frequentist setup, it doesn't get baked in. You know, the model may not be very certain or it may be very confident. It somehow doesn't really uh, get sort of taken into account when it's making the predictions. Um, and so that's really the difference is, you know, are you going in with a solid bet that your model is correct? In which case you go for the frequentist or are you much more sort of uncertain about you know, those parameters in your model? 
and would rather sort of, you know, sort of stack a, a distribution on each of those parameters and then make a prediction which tells you, um, you know, the uncertainty based upon, you know, how uncertain the model is about the parameter fit. Love it. That is, man, that is a great, great explanation. Um, and yeah, for in, at least I know in my case, the more I dive into, into uh, Bayesian uh, analysis, the more uh, value I see in it. And, and you know, I, I see how, how much more useful it is. And um, yeah, huge, huge benefits. I, as I mentioned, I used to work in finance for the last five years. And this year I moved to into healthcare and, and still like Bayesian approaches uh, just um, have been fantastic. So I want to I want to thank you. Uh, I want to thank people that have been putting their questions through to the Q and A section. So we might start uh, firing some of those uh, to to Matthew, and um, the and you can for all the questions that, that people are putting in, you can upvote them. So you can um, you can give it a thumbs up, and we will um, we'll ask Matthew the questions in order of the votes that they've been that they've been getting. And before I ask the first one, I'll mention that. Uh, in the in the chat, um, I put the the link to your book, Matthew, so people could see the table of contents and the book. And AV says, "Beautiful," <laughs> as a response to the book. Um, really, uh, yeah. And then and then uh, they said, "Thanks, Matthew. Your explanation pushed me to start reading your book ASAP." So fantastic, uh, great. So uh, Matthew, first first question from the audience is, which area of mathematics and at what level would you suggest uh, people are, get comfortable with in order to start using ML and AI for finance? So are there, are there uh, many uh, mathematical prerequisites to, the, to your book? Uh, and what, what, type of, what sort of level would you, um, would you have to have before embarking on, on your book? Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, to, to be fair, I mean, it's sort of, I would envision two different sort of, you know, categories of readers, you know, one who's, uh, you know, probably not uh, so interested in all the, you know, the mathematical details um, and just sort of wants to get, you know, to get up and running. Um, and, and then you've got, you know, the more, uh, you know, someone who, who ultimately wants to, to go very deep into this um, and, you know, is, is probably, you know, going, going to sort of ultimately, um, uh, you know, be able to sort of take these things apart and build them back up um, in, in a way that I hadn't envisaged. Um, so I think, uh, you know, I think what you really need more than anything else is uh, a good understanding of linear algebra. Um, because it, it just sort of, it just shows up. Um, it's just a really nice, elegant way to sort of, you know, um, hang, you know, a lot of the notation, a lot of the terminology is just sort of built around good old linear algebra. I mean, of course, you know, machine learning isn't just linear algebra, but I think it really sets the scene for understanding a lot of what, what we do with neural networks, which is essentially, you know, linear algebra plus something else. So I think that's, that's number one. Um, and, you know, any kind of good introductory book uh, on linear algebra, uh, the book actually recommends some kind of entry point readings. Um, there's an excellent book by Diet Roth um, called Math for Machine Learning. It's a new book that's out. Um, there's another book by Gilbert Strang, who's a very famous MIT professor on linear algebra. Um, you know, you can pick that up with, you know, an engineering undergraduate degree uh, and, uh, and sort of get, get somewhere with it. Um, and I think it just, it's just a good warm up um, and it gets you into sort of, uh, you know, thinking about things in a more sort of crystal cut way. Uh, so I definitely recommend that as probably the most important, um, you know, area. And uh, it's not, you know, it's not so difficult. I have a lot of finance students in my class, you know, who did econ or even did an MBA uh, or have a, you know, business undergraduate undergraduate degree. And I always get, you know, always start up with just sort of some basic linear algebra, you know, what's a plane, you know, what's, um, you know, because you need, you need those concepts in, in machine learning, you know, separating hyperplanes uh, and, you know, what's a vector, what's a matrix, um, you know, matrix vector products, you know, what's a tensor, you know, if, if, you know, those things are really just, you know, the core of, of what we do in computing. Yeah, 100%. Great, great answer. Thank you. Uh, we also have a, a question from Sergio. And he says um, that these days there's a lot of platforms to where you can invest online um, and that uh, you, you are able to get a lot of data from, from them. Uh, but usually the... 
the implementation of like you can sorry they say you can get the data you can build the model but then exec getting that model to do the execution uh, is is sometimes a, a problem uh, can you can you talk a little bit about that is it is it possible for for people to jump from a model into the the execution of of the trades and the implementation of those models uh, from the investment platforms that are available to uh, to retail investors, or is it only something that's that's um, available for institutional uh, investors? Yes, I definitely agree. You know, there's it's one it's one thing to be you know uh, looking at machine back testing machine learning, uh, you know, in, in sort of back testing environments that you know are easy to use with interactive brokers, for example. Uh, you know, I think um, you know, and and it's worth mentioning as well that uh, you know some of the best. Uh, environments for uh, you know writing machine learning code in production execution where speed is really an issue as well latency of the code you, you don't want to be probably doing Python you want to be doing something like C++ um, and and so if you're really in the game of trading uh, and speed is an issue you know in terms of getting those trades filled placing them competitively um, you know there are uh, you know there are sort of professional grade um, you know products like uh, trading technologies, for example, they'll often give a license out, a trial license uh, to get your hands on that. And you can program that in, in C++ uh, and, and put in your code, baking your code there. Um, so I think, you know, trading technologies probably has one of the best APIs I've seen. Um, and there's also Deltix, uh, D-E-L-T-I-X. Uh, that one is probably, you know, beyond the reach of a, of a retail investor. Um, but I think, you know, you've got to seriously ask yourself whether, you know, a bit of Python code is going to be the right thing for an execution environment. Uh, and I know several retail investors that have built their models and they're not too concerned about, you know, high, you know, spe speed in their trades. They've built it around interactive brokers. They've been able to place orders um, through interactive broker feeds. Uh, and, you know, the, uh, and so they've been able to, you know, to essentially write Python uh, around it. Uh, and it definitely takes, you know, some work. You, you're writing in callbacks. Um, and so the way that you code, you know, is a little bit different. Um, but I think it's it's definitely doable. Yeah, that's fantastic. That's that's really good. And uh, the next question is from APRI. And um, they're asking about what are, what are the areas, um, they say, can you please share with us the most popular problem in banking that requires machine learning to solve um, to solve the problem? Whether that's on the, uh, do you see that being more on the risks on the risk side, um, and or or obviously the the trading side that we were talking about just before, or the customer relationship side, and um, and and out of those, are there problems that are required sort of for for um, every day, so for the, the banks to to improve their business, and are there problems that are good research areas as well? So they're asking about the, the two sides um, in there. So obviously, a quite a compound uh, question, uh, but uh, let me let me know. I can I can read parts through it again. Yeah, no, that that makes sense, and um, you know, it's it's you know, the caveat in my answer is that. You know anything that's easy to do has already been done. Um, you know, the the biggest application was on the consumer. You know, is and, and probably remains to be on the consumer side. You know, consumer lending, uh, business lending. You know, machine learning has been used for probably 40, 40 years uh, in terms of you know predicting uh, defaults. You know, trying to estimate uh, credit events, uh, and you know those areas have. Uh, you know, those areas are very popular as well as uh, in, again, in retail banking, fraud detection. Um, so, you know, when is someone fraudulently using a credit card, for example, uh, you know, those are, those are, are, are great areas. Um, for, uh, trying to uh, thwart uh, essentially hacking attempts into banking systems. So a lot of bank security, again, on the retail side, uh, you know, they deal with tremendous amounts of, uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, various types of, uh, you know, denial of service attacks um, and, and so on. And they need ways of detecting or predicting when those are going to happen. 
uh, and, and essentially where they're going to happen in terms of uh, you know, location, uh, IP entry point. Um, so those are, there's a lot on the retail side, and a lot of people who, who have machine learning but don't know anything about finance often go into that area. And it's sort of broadly under the topic of operational risk or credit risk. Um, and so, you know, the, the, the downside there is that, you know, there's already a lot of, you know, very talented data scientists working in these areas, you know, uh, for these banks like Wells Fargo, for example, or, uh, you know, um, any, of the big, any of the big banks. On the other hand, if you're sort of willing to really go a little bit more niche and delve in deeper, you'll find there's a lot of um, research to be done, a lot of fairly fresh, uh, you know, uncharted territory on the trading side. Uh, derivatives trading has been a huge problem for many reasons. One of the biggest problems of derivative trading on the risk side, which is a financial require, it's a regulatory requirement for banks to be able to model their risk, their market risk, that is. So they have books, they have thousands of, you know, tens of thousands, more, more than that, uh, derivatives, and they've got to measure the risk and the amount of computation you need to do to do that using traditional techniques like Monte Carlo is very difficult. So one area is, is doing what's called surrogate modeling, where essentially uh, the machine learning model learns a more computationally intensive model. It sort of mimics the behavior of it. And then it just throws that more computationally intensive model away. And then it just has like a thin lookup, which is the machine learning method once it's fitted. And it enables a, you know, an order of magnitude speed up because you're no longer having to do you know, number crunching in real time. You've done the number crunching offline kind of training the model. And then in real time, you're then just feeding it through a neural network to get the outcome of a sort of a model that's predicted what another model is. So that has really interesting implications uh, in terms of opening up a whole new uh, area of, uh, of sort of sensitivity modeling um, and in the areas of derivatives. Another area is just a lot of these models that are developed are just not good enough for a lot of derivative applications. You know, when you try to fit derivative models to data, it ends up just bouncing all over the place and day to day and traders get very annoyed because, you know, you recalibrate the model and it gives you a completely different set of results. And, and so the idea is, you know, how could you sort of stabilize that or even, you know, throw away a lot of the computationally intensive part of that. And again, that's where machine learning can come in. So that's under the area of surrogate modeling. And, and it requires kind of an understanding of derivatives, you know, pick up a book, you know, if you're not so familiar on, you know, derivatives by Hull, for example, but there's a, you know, the OTC derivatives market is massive, right? I mean, I think, you know, it's, it's on the order of something like 640 trillion US dollars, right? You know, Bitcoin, the market cap of Bitcoin is hundred billion. So we're talking right. a massive difference in the amount of money that's traded, you know, between banks. Most of the risk, most of the, the big, uh, you know, the big uh, sort of juicy parts of what banks have to manage is over the counter. It's not, a, not fire exchanges. And I think, you know, if you can get into that area with machine learning, um, into the areas where, you know, uh, it isn't so sort of systematized yet, like bond trading, like municipal bonds, uh, a lot of bespoke kind of contracts which just haven't had anyone touch it yet with machine learning mm -hmm. to figure out. And that's what a lot of, you know, trading firms are trying to get their head around right now is, you know, sort of going to the, to the you know, the corners where uh, it hasn't been sort of heavily commoditized. Brilliant strategy, I would say. Yeah, go, go where there's um, the new, new ground, take these techniques into new areas. Um, I also wanted to ask you about, about the section that you have or a chapter that you have on interpretability. Um, obviously, a, a, uh, a topic that's, that's um, gaining a lot of traction in, in the last couple of years or so, uh, but I haven't seen it um, as, you know, as, as well uh, applied to, to finance as, as a focus that you guys have. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about um, the, the thoughts behind including that and why you saw it as important, an important part of the book? Yeah, I think you know, the, big, the big pushback right now in finance um, has been you know, lack of interpretability. And, and you know, to be frank, it just you know, outside of very computer science sort of centric trading groups, uh, you know, there's there's a considerable number of people, you know, regulators, um, you know, uh, more conservative model risk managers, 
who, who really hate the fact that, you know, deep learning, for example, is just not interpretable. I mean, you've got all these different parameters. You know, a lot of, a lot of models are, are given to a regulator by passing them, giving them the fitted parameters and saying, look, you know, here's our linear regression model. It had 16 covariates. Here are the parameters. This is our model. And if you go and hand over, you know, a model that has, you know, 10,000 weights and, you know, and say, well, that's our model, it's going to sort of, you know, be met with a, a lot of, you know, blank faces. And so I think interpretability is, is a must, um, not only to appease regulators, to appease, uh, you know, non-technical uh, finance professionals, but also, I mean, it's just, you know, a, a sort of, um, you know, when something goes wrong, uh, and you're able to explain why it went wrong. I think it it can ultimately take some of the edge off that sort of butterfly feeling. You just you know your models just lost a lot of money uh, for a trading firm, and you've got to fix it. You know, I mean that's the reality that traders live in. They they really live in the reality of my my models making lots of money right now. I'm going to go out and party. It's usually my models just lost some money, um, and I'm on the hook. And if it loses more money, I could really have my head on the chopping block. So interpretability kind of gives you a lifeline, like what's going wrong? Is it a data issue? What's caused the model to do that? Why did it get it wrong? Is it something that can be fixed you know, um, through, through data feed fixes? So I think it's, it's just a must, uh, and it's a must in a sell to the investment in management industry, which is very hardwired to regression, just loves its regression models. Uh, if you look at finance or the journals, they love their regression. Yeah. You know, it's a hard sell if you can't provide all the sort of diagnostics you got with linear regression. They're just not going to buy into it. Agreed. That's that's fantastic. Um, so, Matt, I know I know that we're uh, we're coming up we're coming up on time, and this has been a, a fantastic conversation. And I want to thank you so much for it. Before before we go, uh, I wanted to ask you one one last question, and. Um, I wanted to ask you kind of like a, looking back to your, looking back over your career and everything that you've done and everything that you've achieved, uh, what, what are you most proud of that you've done? Yeah, I think, um, you know, what's, you know, the book has certainly been, been a culmination. Um, I think more than anything else, um, it's being able to sort of um, untether myself from the herd um, and maintain mm -hmm a certain amount of independence and autonomy and, and get comfortable with that. Um, it's not, you know, it, it's quite daunting when you're younger uh, and you kind of break off from the, you know, the, the well-trodden path. So in a way, you know, I'm, I'm a contrarian. I, you know, I like to, I've always been a bit of a rebel. Um, and I think just sort of, I'm, I'm proud of more than anything that I've been able to sort of be authentic to myself um, and just, uh, you know, be very comfortable with, not necessarily going with the flow in the industry. I think it's really made a huge difference. I mean, character at the end of the day is, uh, you know, is is what you know. If, if you're the sort of person that has the conviction to really stand up and do something new, uh, and be willing to stand out with those ideas, uh, so I think personally, it's a lot of the personal development work I've done. Um, you know, to go from being a, a little sort of nerdy mathematician, you know, engineer type, to someone that's able to sort of you know, challenge the status quo and, uh, you know, be, be considered, you know, up, upset some of the, you know, the higher up lords and canons and so on uh, who, who don't want machine learning. I love it. I love it. Yeah, I, I was, I was yeah, wondering whether um, you felt that the book was um, a, a, um, a pinnacle of a, of a career so far because of all the, um, you know, all your experience and, and everything that you've done today to get solidified into, into this uh, textbook that, that, you know, I know that a lot of people were, I, we can see from the comments, a lot of people are, are rushing out to, to get. Um, I'm so glad to hear that that's the case. And Matthew, I want to thank you so much for, for your time, for sharing your journey, your insights. Uh, they're absolutely fantastic. I, uh, there's many things that I love about the book. I particularly love how you're using you know, uh, deep learning in, with, in, in time series. Uh, I think that's, that's fantastic. And I love the, the fact that you are, um, as you said, being a contrarian, that uh, one of the trends that I've seen is around auto ML, where people are just 
throwing all the compute that they can to, to build multiple machine learning models. And you're saying, well, how about we take a different approach and we run some statistical tests and be a little bit smarter about how we choose what algorithms to, to try. That's just some, some of the applications, uh, some of the areas of the book that, that I love. I think it's a fantastic book. I want to thank you again for, for writing it, for uh, getting it out there, finishing the massive task, giving away all your um, weekends in 2019. And thanks so much for, for sharing, with it, uh, sharing it with us today. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to speak with you all and uh, you know, looking forward to future Futurology podcasts. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone, for, for joining. I'll see you on the next one. Have a great day, everyone.